is ready and we are now recording. Okay, I have to say okay for the pro recording. Okay. Okay, I'm ready. I believe so. Okay, Valerie, I think we're all set, so okay. the floor is yours. Okay, welcome colleagues and friends, and we're um, and welcome to our forum and discussion about the war in Ukraine. This is sponsored by the SPCL, Somatics, Phenomenology, and Communicative Leadership Community of Practice at Fielding Graduate University. And um, the, we're going to start with, since we're body, mind, spirit folks, we're going to start with a somatic uh, sacred circle dance, a very short one, uh, led by Dr. Evie Beck. Dr. Evie Beck holds a doctorate in several fields. The first is in comparative literature. She wrote a book on Franz Kafka. Or after this, she got a doctorate in clinical psychology from Fielding and began to get engaged in sacred circle dance as a form of healing superior to psychotherapy. She recently received her third doctorate, an honorary doctorate from a university in Vienna because of her work in music and social justice. She also was one of the founders at the University of Maryland in, of Women and Gender Studies. And she's been teaching sacred circle dance worldwide for a couple of decades. So we're going to start with uh, a very brief circle dance. We'd like you all to stand and dance together with Evie. This is a very simple dance. It is a dance done by a group called Emma's Revolution, who said, if it's not my rev, it's for Emma Goldman. She said, if it's not my, if we can't dance, it's not my revolution. It's a dance. <laughs> so it's a dance that's deeply, it just has peace in three languages, in English, in Arabic, and in Hebrew. We're using the conflict in the Middle East as a kind of a symbol of peace that we need all over the world. So right now we will think of the Ukraine and Russia and all of the countries that are endangered as we dance this simple dance. The motto of our dancing is there are no mistakes, only variations. I will show you some simple steps but in your home, and even if we were together, we would be holding hands, you could make the steps your own. But the steps that I will show you are just very simple steps, right, left, right, and then left, right, left, right, left, right, left. So just, it's a kind of a weight change. Left, right, right, and just move to the rhythm that's the most important thing, is that you move to the rhythm around the circle, imagining that we're all holding hands together. In fact, usually before we dance, just take a minute to have a breath together. In and let it go. And now I'll put on the music and just dance around to this beautiful song, Peace, Salam, Shalom. 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 
capacity to bring us together. Valerie, you're on mute. You're muted. Thank you, so sorry. I was just thanking Evie for the wonderful dance and saying that at the end we'll have a, another closing one on We Are All One. That's a really beautiful one. We will do together at the very end. Welcome everyone. Dr. Bart Beekner is with us and hosting this. And we have some of our wonderful and kind guests coming to us from Poland. And we have uh, Tatiana, who's here from Ukraine. She was from Ukraine. We have uh, Elena, who's from Russia, living in San Francisco. And so most of our time today will be for them to share their experiences of the, the war that's so, so horrendous in the, for all of us, but especially for those who are there and who are close by. But we're going to start with a brief introduction to who we are and how it is that we came to work together. Uh, Dr. Bart Beekner is going to show us just a few, um, just give us a very brief introduction to who we are as a somatics phenomenology and uh, communicative leadership community of practice. And we do meet monthly and we work together, we research together. And we even danced together a little bit like we just did. So Bart, would you like to show us our introduction? Sure, I will be happy to bring that up. Let's give me just a second to uh, do so. And we should be uh, uh, ready again. Uh, as Valerie said, this is the uh, uh, Somatics Phenomenology and Communicative Leadership uh, Community, which is originated out of a, a concentration combining these disciplines at Fielding and uh, quite a few different projects and, and uh, efforts have come out of that, uh, uh, that fusion, I guess, between understanding the phenomenological uh, understanding of the world that we have and how we're somatically embodied in it and how we create our social worlds in communication. So uh, the agenda that we have on tap uh, today is to look at uh, taking a phenomenological and communicative and uh, in many ways embodied uh, perspective on the, uh, the crisis that we have in, uh, in Ukraine uh, in that part of the world. And uh, also in context of two projects that have come out of the community. One is the Death Worlds to Life Worlds project, which is a mapping of life world and death world uh, characteristics globally. Uh, Dr. Jim Marlett has been a big part of, of organizing that. So we'll do a little bit of an overview of, of that project as well as the collaboration with Strangers Project, which was done with the University of Woods. I see Christoph Konecki is on the call as well. 
and uh, some students from the University of Virgin Islands. So within that context, we want to uh, particularly hear uh, voices and experience of our colleagues from Poland, uh, Ukraine, and Russia uh, who are on the call with us. And we've invited Krzysztof Konecki uh, to lead that part of the discussion, which uh, we should be ready to begin here momentarily and then uh, uh, have some discussion among the group and then we can all check in, I would say, at that time. And then Evie has uh, invoked us and closes us with the sacred dance. And uh, just as a quick overview, and Valerie, please jump in at any point in here uh, to elaborate uh, if you wish, but there are a couple of uh, book projects that have originated out of this work, uh, Life Worlds to Death Worlds as a, uh, as a collection or uh, different stories. Some of the, these were co-authored by students at University of Woods and, and other uh, and fielding and other places uh, that illustrate some of the concepts of uh, understanding the difference between life worlds and death worlds and recognizing what the makes that up and then what factors are and are not perhaps under our control. Uh, part of that also is the, the core teaching for this comes uh, has been assembled uh, as a way to pass it on in the handbook of transformative phenomenology, uh, which provides, so we use that as a core cur curriculum uh, with the University of the Virgin Island in their creative leadership course. So uh, again, just a, a quick uh, uh, synopsis of that is that uh, we're looking at contextual forces that either add to life or uh, take us in a, a destructive uh, direction. And the problem is, is that once we create a death world as a context, it, it creates other uh, uh, problematic things which, which extinguish life as, as we, we know it and, and wish to uh, 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 engage in it. And here is just a summary of qualities of life worlds and death worlds that are summarized from the book. Uh, Valerie, did you want to say just a little bit about this before we move on? Uh, just said uh, for for so long in the social sciences, the way we looked at society was objectively um, as an object, uh, whether a biological organism or a machine or a cybernetic system. And then with Alfred Schutz, the uh, brought he brought the idea of life worlds along with Husserl to our thinking. So we started to look at how we live together from within rather than objectivize, objectivizing it. So, so the concept of life worlds has been written about for oh, quite a while from within. However, it seems so important that we start to point out what a lot of what we see as life, life world is really creating death, not promoting life all over the planet. Now we're facing a great climate and extinction crisis. So we started to highlight this by calling out death worlds. And these, I see Bruce Novak is on the call and, and maybe uh, uh, Valerie, if you wanted to invite Bruce to say a little bit about that or however you'd like to proceed with that. But uh, thought these would be some very uh, poignant quotes to share with the group. I'm just said, um, Dr. Novak has been participating with our community on some of the uh, Society for Phenomenology and Human Sciences meetings and meeting with students. And his work comes from the heart of phenomenology. He studied with Paul Ricoeur and others. And he, he highlights what we do that, as Husserl mentioned before World War II and the crisis, we're facing a great existential crisis of who we are as human beings. And I, want, I thought that some of Bruce's recent work really highlights this for us. I, I don't know, Bruce, if you wanted to, to read one of your quotes or just say hi. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Um, I'll do whatever you want me to. <laughs> I was going to say, Valerie, you should put an O in your name for Valor. Oh, thank you. This is very, very courageous work. Thank you, Bruce. And... Uh, Anyway, uh, so let, we want to move on though, because our purpose is to hear from our colleagues from mm -hmm. Poland, Ukraine and Russia most of all today. 
hopefully we can come back in the discussion uh, to uh, go over some of these things. We can skip back to any of these slides that we would like to uh, as to, uh, part of informing uh, that discussion. But uh, this, I think uh, the idea is that the life world has been altered by us and in, in many ways. And the, uh, the Strangers to Collaborators project, uh, which was the subject of the, the book that we just mentioned a little bit ago, was, was undertaken as a collaboration between uh, Valerie and uh, Christoph Konecki. And we also involved the University of the Virgin Islands and their students uh, with this. So you know, it was framed as, as kind of a co-exploration uh, as ways that people from completely different cultures, different backgrounds, different languages could uh, perhaps find ways to transcend some of these death world, uh, death worldly divisions by coming together to collaborate across differences and, and write about that in a phenom phenomenologically informed way. So uh, we may get a chance to talk a little bit about that uh, uh, as a part of this later on. Uh, the, other, the other framing of this that we wanted to put out there is that uh, phenomenal, phenomenology as a transformative practice is something that, uh, that Alfred Schutz may have uh, foreseen, but it didn't happen in his time as a way to, to uh, productively engage in uh, changing the uh, problematic uh, contextual phenomena that we're living in by understanding them better. And uh, again, from within perspective of our uh, concentration at fielding, we look at the embodied or somatic qualities of that. Uh, hermeneutics is a way of understanding the context and uh, phenomenology uh, and communication as a way of uh, taking a uh, uh, practical theoretical mm. approach to how these things were created in the first place and how we might deconstruct and, and alter those. And uh, we will probably come back to this slide later, I think, if we, if we need to, unless, uh, Valerie, you wanted to say something about it now. No, it's just that it's, uh, it's an image that uh, Bart found for us. Um, years ago, we looked over the 100 dissertations that phenomenologists at Fielding had done, and we discovered that they all said and acknowledged that they had themselves changed from the process and we were David Rohorek, my colleague and I, who wrote a book on this called Transformative Phenomenology, uh, found that they all had these qualities. So um, we call them the 10 qualities of phenomenologists. So we'll come back to this later if we do have time. Okay, and so that probably is a good cue to take us out of the uh, uh, the framing mode and into the the substance and working with the folks that have joined us uh, for this conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Bart. And I also wanted to acknowledge uh, the work of Dr. Jim Miller, our alum, who's also a geographer, works with the UN internationally on climate issues and graduated from fielding. He has been the key to helping making this research project work. He set up the framework. He set up our death worlds to life worlds mapping, story mapping we're now engaged in. And he's having some connectivity problems. So Jim, we miss you and we hope you can still join us. Uh, okay, well, I'd especially like to start with uh, Dr. Professor Konecki because without Professor Konecki, who is the um, chair of sociology and in the business and management at the University of Łódź. He's the chair of president of the Polish Sociological Association, the editor of the journal Qualitative Research. He studied symbolic interaction. I think it was at UC Berkeley. And so you, he so well blends um, phenomenology and uh, critical thinking with his work. And because of him, we were able to do the project that led to the books because he so kindly invited me to come to the University of Uch and spend a few months and, and work with the wonderful folks there. So Christoph also is a poet. And Christoph, please uh, share what your experiences of what the war going on now. I know you've been helping some 
taking in and helping Ukrainian folks in your home and in your community. Okay, may I start? Yes. Please. Okay, thank you, uh, Valerie, for invitation. A very kind invitation. I'm not so much prepared to uh, to do uh, any presentation or, but, uh, and any time I'm prepared, <laughs> because we are in such situation that we should we should take the action and have also some reflection of what is going on. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, I'm writing diary. Uh, you can say protocols, uh, what we studied with Valerie in Wuj, uh, transformative phenomenology, and this kind of uh, getting uh, empirical materials and I'm trying to develop still uh, contemplative uh, methods, if you like this term or not, I'm using it. Uh, then I work with myself with the first person perspective. Then what happened? We have the war at the border of uh, our country. And of course, the, a lot of people are suffering there and uh, we are trying to help them. We open the heart. We have more than two millions of refugees in Poland and generally the, the society, the people, individual, uh, they decided to help personally and uh, they receive the refugees at home. Uh, I have also family and Dagmara is with us also uh, from the project, uh, you know uh, very well, uh, Valerie Dagmara. Dagmara is receiving also refugees and maybe other people also, but I don't know uh, from Poland. Then we are dealing with this problem. Uh, and of course we live in the fear because the, the war, uh, is so close, close, and we we are not sure what will happen in a days. So we are waiting for something, and this the time perspective is interesting. We we work every day. We do what we used to do, uh, but there is no no future. Uh, perspective that we can plan for sure what will happen. We are just hanging at the present moment and the best way what we can deal with our fear with this uncertainty, ontological uncertainty is, is to help others. This is the best tactics, I think. Uh, we can, of course, write we can reflect, we can make uh, some, uh, mm. uh, we can collect money, but it's probably the best way is to help directly and have contact with the people that you can help uh, them and to feel, to feel that your, your values are in use, not only declared values. And we are trying, I'm telling mainly from my perspective, but probably Dagmara agree with me also that uh, the direct action is, is the best. And in the meantime, I'm reading the book and the book is by Zygmunt Bauman, a Polish sociologist. Uh, the book is uh, uh, Modernity and uh, Holocaust. The Modernity and Holocaust. And this is compatible, uh, his op views and opinions are uh, similar to, to what, to our opinion, what uh, uh, Valerie and Jim Marlat wrote and others in their paper and later book about deaf words. Then 
modernity and the science and bureaucracy that is emanation of, of the modernity helped to uh, realize Holocaust without perfectly organized bureaucracy and uh, uh, scientific rules that were in use in, in, in biology, in chemistry, and uh, also in social engineering, because Goebbels used uh, uh, movies and uh, some um, public manifestations of the hate uh, to integrate a community against the Jews. Uh, and I think that this modernity, uh, this, this uh, mentality of modern modernity still exists and nothing changed mm -hmm. since the 30s and the beginning of the 20th century. And look at what happened in Russia. The, the, the bureaucracy and uh, technology, internet and um, TV, uh, media, social media are used to control the, the society, to control the hate and to cut the empathy and to create uh, such anti-empathic walls, empathy walls against other nations. And it's incredible, but it's so similar what Bauman wrote about uh, Nazis Germany. Uh, they were cut mentally from the rest of the world and who the world was the enemy to, to these uh, pure nations, uh, uh, Aryans uh, coming from the German, German uh, nations. And now is the same. West is the enemy for, for the Russia. Russia is exceptional. Uh, it's, the values are based on the nationalistic, econ, uh, uh, nationalistic ideology and also um, some tradition very strongly um, rooted in the literature, in this big culture that it's not big culture as one of the, of the uh, Ukrainian uh, anthrop anthropologists uh, wrote lately, the big culture is culture that create empathy, that open the mm -hmm. heart to other people. This is the big culture, not the culture that is based on the hatred to another nations. And we could find in Dostoevsky and, and other books, uh, some, uh, some uh, um, intention to exclude others from the right uh, trends in the history that only is coming with Orthodox Church and with the Russian nationalism and um, Tsarship uh, that will uh, get the power above the world. And it's only one way to save the West from the scene. Uh, this is what I feel now. And uh, I'm thinking maybe like Ukrainian um, people, I'm close to them. And I think that what Bauman wrote is, is, is uh, right and applied also, applied also to, to the current situation. Uh, and the Holocaust was possible thanks to modernity. And what is going now is also, uh, I think uh, we, we should, should we should uh, find the causes in mo modernity. You have these uh, business connections that are still exist, still exist. It's like in during the second war, the General Motors and <coughs> Opel and IBM was still cooperating with, with Germans. And uh, uh, in Auschwitz, they used the, the calculation from IBM now it's transport from the West of the new technology still is going to the Russia. How it happened, it's, it's, the, it's the way how the liberal world and economy works. And this is the, the modernity way of dealing with 
um, with uh, the life world that is becoming the deaf world, definitely deaf world. Maybe we don't have racism now, but anyway, nationalism is a, some equivalent of, 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 of the, of the um, racism that existed uh, uh, in, in Nazi, Nazi Germany. And reading Bauman, I translate maybe, he wrote in English, but, uh, but uh, I read in Polish, then I translate once again to English. The hate of one person and absolute power uh, didn't have to meet in the past, but they meet and they can meet once again. This is the quotation from, from the Bauman. And it happened, in ha it happened. But we, as a sociologist, I know that we shouldn't um, explain everything uh, connecting with one person. Yes, he is war criminal. It's obvious for everybody that, is, uh, that has uh, access to the uh, information from Ukraine. Yes, but he's not only alone. This is the connection with other groups of interest. This is the system that was created globally. This is globalization, globalization of the deaf world. Thank you, Valerie, for this term, because it's very useful. We have the global, globally uh, created the system of deaf world. It's based on the connections of the exploitation of the nature, uh, exploitative economy and uh, that is spreading around the world uh, and we have the effects of it we have the effects of it okay i'm talking too much i have so much to say oh uh, thank but, you krista but it's, it's enough okay thank uh, you so so profound and i know you've also Christoph is also a poet and perhaps you may share some of your poems in the sh in the chat, um, or if you get a chance, the poems are profound. I would like to also ask uh, Dagmara, who uh, Christoph mentioned, she was in our uh, class at um, in Wuch and is currently working. On the, on, on the line and trying to help Dagmara. She's soon to be Dr. Dagmara. <laughs> yes, we will see. Uh, uh, good afternoon, good, good, uh, good morning for you. Uh, thank you for uh, invitation. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking what should I talk to you and I know that I don't want to comment on the war uh, but I would like to share uh, my experience of the war um, because, as Professor Konecki said, we um, invite um, refugees under our roof. Um, and in order to manage, I think, with the situation, um, I started to uh, write a lot, uh, some kind of diary or something like this. And I would like um, to read to you my four notes, um, which I made during uh, this time. Um, and uh, I will start with the uh, day our guest came to us. Uh, it was uh, over one month ago. Um, and now we uh, live with uh, mother, uh, Mariana her daughter, Camila, grandmother, Natalia, and mother-in-law, mother um, Irena. So four women, uh, five with me, my husband, uh, our dog, uh, so interesting mix. Uh, and here is what I wrote uh, our, in our first day. I will read it. I cooked Ukrainian borscht it's traditional uh, soup from beetroots. I thanked myself for having too many towels. I appreciate the free room apartment. I was touched 
<laughs> when the youngest of our Ukrainian roommates immediately clung to Pusha, our dog, and as she dove into her bag for the plush rabbit ears, which she pulled over her eight year old head. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I don't really know how to behave yet. I'm a bit clumsy. I would like to disappear for a few days so uh, that the girls can really relax and feel at home. Meanwhile, I try to be invisible. I don't know uh, if it's good. Uh, it is a great privilege that we had the opportunity to have at least in this way. And don't hold it against yourself if you don't have this opportunity. <clears throat> and after a week uh, of living together, I uh, wrote another second note, um, and I will read you also. It's not fun living with roommates. There is a morning stress on whether the bathroom will be free. There is silence from 10 p.m. because girls fell asleep early. In the evening, talks are in whisper, like in church. Uh, there's a disgusting sweet smell of meat in the fridge that makes my head spin. I don't eat meat. And this meat is on plate, not in a pot, shiny and pink. This is a problem because we don't uh, eat meat. It's not fun living with roommates. We don't make dumplings together and we don't eat together to the rhythm of Ukrainian melodies. We don't even talk because we can barely understand each other. It's not fun living with roommates, but it doesn't matter today. Today is difficult for me to live in the self-care rhythm and even more difficult to accept it. Today I feel uncomfortable, un uncomfortable but their relatives are dying. Mothers and fathers, Grandmothers and grandparents, kids, wives, husbands, lovers, friends, dogs, cats, hamsters. I hope the war will not become commonplace because it is certain that it will tire. And uh, another third note uh, in the diary was made after, uh, I must say to the story, we returned re return our home one day and three of our four Ukrainian women were no longer in our apartment. Um, and did, did, they didn't say goodbye to us. Uh, they left for another city, we were surprised. And uh, more, uh, the more than a um, few days, uh, something about a few days, they came back to us without a word again. And I, and I wrote this note. The smell of fried onion greeted us already on the staircase. Ira, the Ukrainian who stayed with us, was frying pancakes with liquid stuffing, although the fridge is full. I have news, she exclaimed happily from the farm. They come back to us. Uh, how are they coming back? Why are they coming back? After all, they just left yesterday. Why didn't they call us if they know our number? Um, I started to throw out more of myself to her. Why are you asking again, how much have you paid for the apartment? Even though we said that you are with us for free, why are you still cooking? After all, everything is even too much, who will eat it? And I knew that we are going to eat it because Ira can't eat fried meals, fried meals. I was eating big wet pancakes, chewing them along with my own shame. And today I was ashamed of my ideas about our common life with refugees, in which we give them what we have, we share everything with them, and they accept it, probably with gratitude. How do they do as refugees, right? And it turned out that they don't want to be grateful. They want clear billing, clear billing rules, separate toilet papers even, their own food and peace of mind. And, and they don't want to consult their decision or ask us for advice. I needed a week to understand that our guests are not our pupils 
we should not accept gratitude for them, neither sympathy. It may turn out that they don't like us or we don't like them. They might not want to have dinner together. They may be tired of us. They can be much more independent than we assumed. They might not even cope with something and at the same time not want our help. And my last note, uh, my last piece of diary, after three weeks, um, I, after three weeks, I became seriously ill. Um, and at this time, I lived in another apartment because we are uh, taking care of my friend's dog. And Ukrainian women were left alone in our house. And one day, my husband went to them for a while and told to Ira that I am sick. Um, and, and I wrote something like this. Um, allow me a small summary. For the second week, people from grassroots help their Ukrainian neighbors. Between the memes about Brave Zelensky putting the dick and Dudu who plays the president, our president, there are stern news that Poland has partially annulled the European Convention on Human Rights and Russia is talking about chemical weapons. Mm. In order to flatten the stress level, I have been helping myself for the last time with longer walks, which have the title, it's very warm, I have to take off my jacket. And I am sick now, something for something. Maybe this was what I needed to stay out for the last few days. When Ira found out that I am ill, she gave me some advice and jars. She ordered not to swallow the medicines. The body has to fight. Um, but if it reach uh, 39 degrees, use paracetamol. Drink tea with ginger and lemon, cranberry juice, relax. She packed the Ukrainian red borscht in yards, mashed, mashed potatoes, fluffy as a cloud, fried cabbage, and homemade candy and orange peach sweetness. Today, she took care of me. Mm. And this is the end. And uh, these are all my notes. Um, and I hope that I could uh, partially showed how complicated our relation uh, was and actually still is, and how uh, difficult it is to behave in a situation uh, when there is no balance, because we are in our country, in our apart apartment, in our home, and we accept someone who had to run away from their home to strangers, and additionally, um, they, doesn't, they, they don't want to be dependent of us. And uh, this, can, this can generate a lot of extreme emotions. Um, and I hope I was able to show it. Um, I wanted to show uh, the everyday face of war, like a host of refugees. And I can uh, say that now our, our guests are dealing with a uh, visa um, to mm -hmm. United States, to Chicago. Uh, and today they are after um, they talk in embassy um, interview. Uh, so please uh, keep your fingers crossed for them. And thank you for your attention and for your invitation. Mm -hmm. Dagmara, thank you so much for sharing your journal. What a rich experience of life worlds coming together from very difficult, different situations in, the, in a tragic setting and how human and how, how heartening it is that you took them in and shared your experiences. I would like to invite uh, Mel Grzada Burchard Duspinska. She is a colleague in the from the University of Łódź Economics Department. She wrote a chapter in our book, um, Death Worlds to Life Worlds, about her work in the Amazon. But um, Mel Grzada, perhaps you'd like to share a few words about how you see that, how you're experiencing the current 
situation. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, Valerie, for uh, your invitation. Um, I am involved in, in this uh, situation because I became a volunteer and I try to help mothers and siblings of our students, of uh, students of our university who came to us and now they stay in uh, dormitories of uh, uh, our um, uh, academic uh, uh, town. So, uh, in the beginning, I, I would like to emphasize that uh, I, I think that the, the war was predictable. Uh, it was naive if someone thought otherwise. But I must tell that we are not prepared. We, we were not prepared and we are still not prepared for, for, for the war. It was uh, something which is really awful. It, it harmed us uh, very, very deep. And uh, I uh, try to, to explain why uh, we are involved in, in, such, in such a situation. And I, I think that uh, it was a big mistake that the greats of this world believe that a well-dressed guy smelling of good perfume belongs to our world. Putin uh, is from another world. Uh, and uh, his uh, dream uh, about uh, uh, a dream of an, an uh, empire uh, create a sea of, of uh, suffering, which we can observe each day in uh, our smartphones, on TV, and uh, hear about it when we talk with our friends from Ukraine. Uh, each, because I speak Russian, I, uh, I can good contact with uh, our uh, Ukrainian uh, and I uh, have already told you that uh, we have, I have contact with mothers and uh, brothers and sisters of our students. And uh, it can be seen from the behavior who left out uh, Ukraine uh, of fear of the war and who escaped because uh, the bombs fell on uh, her or his house. Uh, and it is really difficult to imagine how uh, these uh, people suffer. And uh, I, I think that they uh, still think about the situation in their uh, houses, in their cities. And it is really difficult to um, continue normal life in Poland. Uh, the children are happy because they can uh, go to school, Polish school, and uh, one of these uh, women told me that in class of her daughter, the half of uh, the group is from Ukraine. So it is also a problem for our uh, education from the, from, uh, from the point of view of our local authorities. It is really difficult to organize this education for children and uh, they try to do it. Uh, and uh, in, in the group of 25 people now, the half is from the Ukraine. But uh, the, the, the children, of course, they uh, speak Ukrainian or, or Russian and they uh, learn very quickly uh, Polish, but of course it is not enough to be active participant of uh, normal classes uh, on the level of 
uh, fifth, sixth, or higher class. It is it is good idea if we talk uh, about small children, but if we talk about uh, teenagers, of course, of course, it is not so easy to organize everything. So it is my my um, observation, and I will continue uh, my cooperation. I. Uh, meet uh, each week with uh, this uh, pupil, uh, and I try to, uh, try to help them to organize, to, to um, manage such uh, institutional uh, requirements as uh, ID number and other such very important things. Uh, and uh, we will see, uh, I, I think that uh, they should uh, plan the next uh, year in, in, <clears throat> in Poland. Uh, so uh, mothers and, and children uh, who stay in our dormitories, of course they are happy because they have almost all for free and they are safety, but they still think about uh, their husbands, their sons, brother who stay uh, in, in Ukraine. And I understand that it is for them very difficult time. And sometimes it is really difficult to help the, them because I don't know what they are, they are thinking about in, in particular moments. And I, I can observe that sometimes they are very sad <clears throat> Sometimes they show me uh, fragments of bombs on the pictures sent by husbands from, uh, for, for example, from, from Kiev or from Odessa. And it is, uh, it is difficult. But uh, uh, children are as children. They like birds, they, they like dogs, and it is very nice when we can observe that they try to find something normal in, in such difficult situation. Uh, and uh, I, I hope that uh, children can, uh, that children will be happy again very soon. But uh, of course, uh, I'm not sure when uh, will be this, uh, this 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 moment this 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 future uh, unfortunately that uh, word is uh, bigger and stronger again i i hope that it is it, that it will be only a while we will see thank you very much thank you so much melgarzada for being with us uh, that we have a not, one other person with us, a Professor Kaspersik, Anna Kaspersik is with us. She's a professor of social psychology, at the University of Łódź, and she also um, wrote a chapter in our Death Worlds to Life Worlds book called The Phenomenology of Trash, very powerful chapter and work. Anna, would you like to share a bit about your experiences? Uh. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I must say that I have a position of someone who is supporting Krzysztof, my husband, Krzysztof Konecki, because he is the, the first person who, who is organized this help for, for Ukrainian family uh, we, we, we care for. Um, and I uh, feel that I, I am only the support for him because, uh, because I have a, a lot of classes and, uh, and a lot of work and uh, having so, so not, not so much, much time to spend time and to organize things uh, for, for, for the family. Uh, mother and uh, 13 years daughter, teenager, and, and the cat. So I, I feel that the main burden is on the on the back of of Krzysztof. But I have also uh, some um, some feelings about this um, huge um, amount of help 
that is created uh, during this time. And, and we can observe so many people who are trying to help our brothers and we treat um, Ukrainian people as someone who is uh, very similar to us. But unfortunately, at the same time, on the border of Belarus, there are another tragedy going on all the time and from many months because uh, there are people from Syria who are not so many eagerly uh, asked to come. So I, I am really, I'm thinking about how much how much we are uh, divided in the in this position of someone who is taking care of someone and um, and don't like to take care of some other people. So we have this uh, this this narrative, this discourse about this really strange position and and. On the um, Belarus border, there are still pushbacks. People are staying uh, in the forest, and they are not uh, they are not um, allowed to enter country. This is all um, against law because they have right to apply to to be to be here and to, to, to have status of um, refugee people. And uh, this is, all this phenomena is somehow unbeliev unbelievable for me. Such big difference between uh, attitudes and, 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 and also this, this organizational, um, part this uh, what this uh, border guards are, are are doing. So for for those people on the Belarus uh, border, uh, people are not allowed even to go and help them and to give them something to eat, to drink, to to give them any, anything to help them. So th th these are my reflections on, on, on about the situation we have now here. And of course, I am very moved about all, all of all of things that things that uh, are happening now. Thank you so much, Anna, for being with us. A very, very moving statement. Some of the comments in the chat are very profound. Uh, our uh, re resident anthropologist, David Willis, has been putting in some very supportive comments as well. We have a alumna with us, uh, Dr. Tetiana Azarova. Her doctoral dissertation was about finding inspiration at times of challenge, a very rich phenomenological study and Tetiana is with us. I wonder if she she's from Ukraine, would like to say a few words. I know, I'm not sure where you're living now. She was living in Pennsylvania, then she moved to Florida, and now she's living uh, in Montenegro, is it? Uh, thank you, Valerie. Thank you for the invitation and uh, warm introduction. Yes, uh, we moved to Montenegro last summer. This is where I live right now. Um, I'll, I'm going to share with you a little bit of my perspective um, based on my life world. And it may be a little bit unusual, um, or maybe not. So I, I just want to start with to just illustrate complexity of this war and what people are dealing with. I'm, I'll be using my example. And before that, I, I want to mention that in past two years, I was working in a field of emotion, emotional and mental trauma with the people who 
suffer from different problems and PTSD and childhood traumas. And I, I was trained with Dr. Gabor Mato in compassion inquiry. And this training gave me, I cannot say completely different perspective, but somewhat different perspective um, to this difficult conflict. Uh, and also, I will mention slightly a spiritual perspective because I had some deep spiritual experiences, which um, also allow me to see this conflict in a different or light. So, first of all, I just want to illustrate how complex and difficult for people this can be. It's, it's I, I think of myself just looking at myself at my roots. I think that I probably purposefully was placed into such situation to have perspectives that I have. So um, I was born in Western Ukraine in ivano frankivsk which used to be a Polish city. And I do have some Polish roots uh, through my mother's uh, ancestors. Um, my mother considers herself Ukrainian, she, but she was born in Russia, in Siberia. And because of her family, my grandparents were deported to Siberia after um, Western Ukraine, particularly Ivan of Frankivsk or Stanislav at the time was um, seized from Poland and became uh, part of uh, USSR. And at some point later on, a lot of uh, Polish Ukrainians were prosecuted and sent to Siberia. This was quite a common uh, thing. Uh, my father considers himself Russian by this day, uh, but he was born in Ukraine and he speaks perfect Ukrainian and he mm, respectfully lived in Ukraine, but may have slightly different perspective towards this conflict. I am married to a Russian man who was born in Russia, uh, but his grandparents were from Ukraine, so he do have some Ukrainian roots. Um, this just to illustrate how complex can be a mix in one family and being placed in such situation, obviously you have friends and relatives on both sides of this conflict. And I know it's not just my family. I know this was very common to Ukraine and Russia of USSR when people were placed and moved and uh, they rarely were just very locally in one place that can be defined by Ukraine or Russia. And when this happened, this was a big shock for me because even though I saw the trends, just, just looking at myself, I could not, it was incomprehensible for me that some people in Russia, even though they feel that they were offended by NATO expansion and that Ukraine was used in their view uh, as, as a potential threat to Russia or, or a field from which missiles can be, or um, weapons can be uh, shot to Russia. I could not comprehend that they would go as far as deciding that the only way to resolve uh, this threat as they perceive that the war, the full-blown war, uh, that there is no diplomatic way to um, manage this. Um, when this happened, I felt, I felt shock. And uh, as, my, as my work with others is deeply embodied, uh, um, I'm very well aware of what's going on in my body and emotions and how my body feels. And I could feel the energies that are going in the field when I was talking to other people, Russian and Ukrainians. I could feel waves of anger, frustration, fear, hatred, waves. It was very difficult to hold. I, I am quite capable of holding this, but for the person who is not who is not embodied, who didn't do healing work. This can be very devastating. This can be like a shock that can almost freeze you. You will, you will go into traditional response, you know, fight, flight, or freeze. And that the freeze would be mm -hmm. very difficult response that 
the body will have to deal with long after this event. By being in a field of trauma for, for a while, and I know the more, new, more modern, more updated trauma definition, which I support, trauma is not events that happen to you or to a person, but it's the way your whole system handles this event and the and and uh, the separation that is created from yourself from others from the world that's the trauma and i observe this trauma again again and again and i see this right now and i see this in the people with whom i talk i see a lot of polarization and you cannot argue logically with traumatized people. You just can't. Um, I spoke with my close, very close friend. She's very intelligent. She used to be a professor uh, in Ukraine. And when I was talking with her about peace, she was so angry. Like I could, could feel that anger. It was difficult to talk. Uh, and she was wondering how can I even mention peace when we have to fight the enemy and to fight the enemy we have to stay angry and hate otherwise how can you fight the enemy how can you even comprehend that someone is an enemy mm. and i cannot it's impossible to argue this out it's impossible to create a logical argument and i can tell you i I was in the situation when I had to deal with uh, a relative who had suicidal ideation. It's one of the most difficult uh, situation where anyone can be because you can lose this person anytime and you cannot argue with them that life is worth living, right? It's an enormous trauma is going on. And the person with whom you're dealing with, if they are in such mental, emotional challenge, they might create all kinds of horror stories about why life is not worth living, about why people hate you, about why you should not trust anyone, about why no one can listen to you, why everything is so difficult. And being with such person, you can at any time get a lot of curses and F words and anything thrown at you. And how would you be in such situation without going off balance and creating another argument and start fighting with them and proving, no, you are wrong. I am right. You're mentally sick. If you say this, it's going to only devastate them more and convince them that you are not ready to see them as a person. You're only there to prove that they are what they already knew, that the whole, the whole world is there to hate them. Why am I mentioning this right now? Because I do have a Russian TV in my TV channels list. Just because that was a part of this package and we can hear what Russian people, Russian pol politicians are talking about and the way they talk precisely how people in, with severe mental and emotional trauma talk. Yes, they see the rest of the world as conspiring to hate Russians, to fight Russians, to fly uh, weapons at them. What kind of response would you expect from such deeply traumatized people? And they are traumatized. It's not just one Putin and not few people around them. They were traumatized by the experiences they lived through as much as Ukrainian people. Many of them ended up in gulags, in Siberia and Magadan, in other not so beautiful places, not so beautiful places. Um, my mother was born in barracks of Siberia in a little village, far, far near Habarovs, some, some, somewhere in that uh, area. She still carries enormous loads of trauma. I can, I can see this flashes sometimes at me when she is triggered. I know I carry these traces of trauma. 
in spite of the deep healing work that I did, in spite of my ability to be in the center, even with all the difficult emotions that I pick up, the energies that I feel, in spite of that work that I am doing with others, ability of my ability to create a safe space for others, find the words that can go directly to heart and give them a sense of safety and that we are interconnected and that there is love and that the love is healing. I know that for a truth that the love is healing energy and that's the energy that's gonna eventually heal this planet through my spiritual experiences. I used to read this a while ago in books or hear from some advanced spiritual people who ex had such experiences, but just by a blessing of working with ayahuasca plant medicine in Amazon, I was moved into this experience when I felt the energy of interconnectedness, no separation. Being in such state and knowing that you cannot hurt anyone, it's just incomprehensible to be in a field of hatred when you are in a field of love. And that moment I comprehended that the change on this planet is possible. But it's a conscious work towards that love, towards moving into that energy, towards fostering that energy, towards reminding about that energy. We are interconnected. And when we are not hurt, when we are not separated and in a shock that trauma creates, we can move into that space. It's possible when we are shocked, when we are traumatized and, and we, we have a great deal of intergenerational trauma. If any one of you are familiar with the work of Thomas Hubel, you can read this in his books. You can read this or you can read Dr. Gabor Mate. There is a lot of other practitioners that I can share with you in case anyone is interested. It just was never acknowledged. It's been now acknowledged, but before it used to be not. It was more of a silence field of science to acknowledge that we deal with enormous loads of trauma. And it's not just Russia and Ukraine. Uh, it's everywhere in the world right now, in many other places. There is no priority in trauma. There is no priority in war. Um, as I look at what is happening between Russia and Ukraine, it just comes to me from a spiritual perspective uh, that since it's also coming after so-called pandemic and also another trauma was created by it, that this is just another event that from my perspective, it just highlights how stupid, how incomprehensible is the war by itself. It doesn't solve anything. It just deepens the trauma. And in the end, if you really have to live together, and we have to live together because we are not ex expelling Russian people to moon or Mars or somewhere, we have to start eventually talking about peace and about how we're gonna live together and how we're gonna deal with our traumas and how we're gonna do some healing work. So I think I shared enough for now. Thank you for listening. Tatiana, thank you, thank you. So beautiful, so moving. We are going to go ahead now, if Elena will speak with us. Elena is Russian, living in San Francisco, a fielding student and I, I understand how hard it is for her to speak because she feels so much like you were describing, Tatiana, the immediate hatred projected toward, quote, the enemy until we're all enemies with everybody else. When I think, as, as others have pointed out, Dr. Konecki pointed out, it is that modernization, the technology, the frame of mind in our world, our common worldview that's our enemy, not any particular culture or people. Elena, would you, would you like to share just a few words about from being Russian and being here 
and going through all this here from here and thanks Valerie thanks everybody I don't think I have to take so much time today because you know it's it's really difficult to share something but I don't I don't feel that this is the best time to to speak for Russians maybe a little bit later with all my respect to those who are suffering right now in Ukraine. I think that uh, it's a difficult time to represent Russians mm -hmm. and especially here. So I just, I just want to acknowledge that as ethnically Russian living here in the United States um, in Bay Area and working in tech, I have relatives and friends from Ukraine, from Belarus, and from Russia. It is really very much difficult time for everybody living here. And uh, just a little note from my personal experience when you are opening your social network. Now, I don't go there at all because it's, 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 it's hard from many, many different perspectives from seeing others and being with others and seeing that it's, it's not obligatory that they can see you as the person, as a human being. I would say that this is the huge call for humanity, for everybody living here again. And thanks Tatiana for mentioning this, our trauma experience, because you know, uh, I grew up in a very small place, the former Gulag labor camp. And I, I used to live in that culture and I inherited this culture. And it's difficult time right now for me and my mother and father who's still living in Russia. And uh, I think that many, many people, they Many people, they, they're trying to do their best right now, even from Russia or like from the United States, from the United States to help to each other. Because again, the huge strategy is we were one single community till, I don't know how many years ago, till maybe, till maybe the conflict uh, has started. And I left Russia at that time, about six or seven years ago. And now this community is so much separated. Sometimes I just don't know who can I call? Because, you know, even if you try to call Russians, it doesn't mean they, they kind of support you because they suffer so much themselves because they are in, we are in between different countries. I am... Um, I'm not citizen yet, and <laughs> I don't feel safe because you know I can I cannot go back to Russia, and at the same time I don't know what what will happen to me here, and uh, I'm I'm not going to share again that I'm I'm suffering because people in Ukraine they're suffering now. It's not about me, but it's just. It's just a little bit another perspective, I'd say, just a little bit another perspective. And uh, I think that maybe later, later, we, as the community living here, if I may speak about it as a community still, because I'm not sure. Now we are just separated. This crisis of the huge separation here, it's, it, this is what we experience right now. And uh, all our pain for Ukrainians, again, I have, I worked in five countries, in Russia, in Ukraine, in Belarus, in Poland, and in Hungary. I have friends everywhere. Or better say I had friends everywhere. I don't know. So this is it. And uh, again, thank you for inviting me. And um, I think that everybody who live here, 
they they just they feel huge pain for all Ukrainians, and they they all have huge empathy to Ukrainians and to Polish people who helping Ukrainians right now and all the Eastern and Western Europe. So, thank you. Thank you, Elena, for your courage and helping us understand the great complexity of, of the whole situation. And I have empathy for your situation and your family as well. I would like to invite Diana Daberstein, who is from Ukraine, one of our students, and she's with us, wondering if she had a few words to add before we need to, um, to close. Hi, Valerie? Can you see me? Yes. Wonderful. It's so good to absorb what is shared. And I would just want to say that I, I have been thinking a lot about life worlds and how historically we have struggled through empire and conquest and colonization and what was disrupted in the situation with this massive assault on Ukraine was the idea that global superpowers held each other in check and what is at risk is not simply the destruction and annihilation of an age-long culture but I think it's the standard that the world holds space for peace. So I think thinking creatively, how do we breathe life into the death world that has become the borderland of Ukraine and create dialogue between Russians and Ukrainians so that perhaps peace can prevail? Because the current approach is just armament and destruction and borders being pushed westward. And in my view, Putin will not stop, the Russians will not stop unless some wave of opposition is created. So I value the tracking of trauma, the historical precedent that we're all damaged and from aggression being hit with an opposing aggression, we will never see the end of these traumas, but it's a time to work really creatively. And I think um, the Polish nation has been tremendous. Other leaders in Europe have been tremendous. And if anything, other countries, China, US, et cetera, can help create the space where there is a way to back out of this and to redo and to align our values. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diana, for sharing. I'm wonderful and not wonderful, but your sharing is and the, the richness of what you've expressed. I'm so deeply moved by all that that has been presented today by each of you and so moved that each of you who have come and attended this. I'm feeling that somehow the um, our community of practice, our somatics phenomenology and communicative group are, has something going for it that we need to move forward together and come up with other, other platforms, other ways we can work together, research together, write together and act as Christoph said so well, we, this is a time for action. So uh, I'm hoping that we can meet again, all of, all of us, and informally through email, as well as together like this to, to figure out what we can do next together and keep on working together. We're almost, uh, please send your email to Dr. Beekner. Maybe Bart, you could put your email in the chat if you'd like to be informed of our next meetings. Um, and we're going to close with a, a wonderful sacred circle dance led by Evie Beck called We Are One. It's bbeekner at adler.edu where um, Bart is a professor at Adler University. Evie, Dr. Yeah, Beck. Hi. 
I think we need to take a deep breath. This was an extremely intense emotional experience. And I've decided we're going to do a very, very simple movement that are really like a ritual dance. The dance is called We Are One, and it is created by that same group, Emma's Revolution. They've done a lot of songs that have helped us get through these difficult times. And I'll just show you the steps, but just move however is good for you. And I also, it, some of it is in Korean because they brought this to Korea. So I'll just, I hope you can listen to the words. And if you can't listen to the words, maybe afterwards, uh, maybe Bart, you can put in, uh, we are one of Emma's revolution lyrics. You can find the lyrics if it's too hard for you to listen to, but they sing, we are one, we will lay down our guns. We are one, we are one. So uh, the steps that I think you should, we could do are just very simple. We just essentially step, close, step, close. We take six steps and then we face the center. And when she sings, we are one, imagine that we're all standing next to each other. We put out one hand, we are one. And you put your other hand on somebody else's hand next to you. Even when she sings it in Korean, Urin Hanan, Urin Hanan. That means we are one, we are one. So just move, step close, step close. And when you hear them singing, we are one, we are one. Just put out one hand like this and another hand like this. And imagine that we are all holding our hands, touching each other, because that is what this can do for us. Smiling face, outstretched hand Through disputes, small and grand We will lay down our guns We are our grief when it's done
in our daughters and sons. so much heavy everyone for being here and thank you for having us and i think we need to shake it out a little bit mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah very a lot that was a wonderful closing but i think we need to shake it out <laughs> <laughs> okay and Shake if it we out. were all together, we'd end up doing a dance that we could really shake it out. So go, when we're finished here, go shake it out. <laughs> As an educator, up this motto, if it's the uh, we're rock not able to lose the world, we need to rock it. Oh, okay. I'm cutting in and out on internet. Sorry. I said, if the if the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, we need to start rocking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Deborah, out there in yes. South Dakota. Oh, yeah, with the Lakota people. Thank you. Yes, yes. Okay. Hope to see you all again soon and stay together. Mm -hmm. Valerie, mm -hmm. thank you for the invitation and happy birthday to you. Oh. Happy birthday. <laughs> Valerie. I can't think of a better way mm. at this time. Happy birthday, Valerie. Birthday. Valerie. <laughs> Valerie. Oh, Happy birthday. Goodbye, birthday. Oh. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, oh. Valerie. You, you are God's gift to the world. Happy birthday. Happy yes. birthday, Dr. Valerie. Birthday. All of you are God's gift. Peace. Bye. Peace.